The year was 1971. At the Domodedovo Air Show near Moscow, Western military attaches witnessed something that would haunt Pentagon planners for decades. A silver delta-winged fighter climbed vertically into the gray Russian sky, its afterburner splitting the air with a sound like tearing metal. This wasn't just another Soviet fighter demonstration. This was the debut of the MiG-21 Bs, powered by the Tomansky R-25-300 engine, an engineering achievement that shattered Western assumptions about Soviet technological capabilities. The pilot, Lieutenant Colonel Pavel Kutakov, pushed the throttle forward, and the aircraft responded with acceleration that defied its compact dimensions. The engine's roar wasn't the refined whistle of Western turbofans. It was visceral, immediate, like controlled explosion channeled through titanium and steel. American observers would later report to the CIA that they had witnessed something that shouldn't exist according to their intelligence estimates. This wasn't just another incremental engine upgrade. It was Soviet design philosophy reaching its zenith, extracting maximum combat capability from minimal mechanical complexity, creating a power plant that could operate from Arctic ice strips to Middle Eastern sand-blown runways with equal reliability. The R-25-300 represented something far more significant than improved thrust figures. It embodied an entirely different approach to aerial warfare, one that prioritized operational readiness over theoretical perfection. Inciting conflict, when giants stumbled. For two decades following World War II, Western aviation had pursued an increasingly complex path toward air superiority. Engines evolved into masterpieces of precision engineering. The Pratt & Whitney J-79 powering the F-4 Phantom boasted 17 compressor stages and variable stator vanes, requiring specialized tools and extensively trained technicians for even routine maintenance. British Rolls-Royce Avon engines were marvels of metallurgical achievement, each turbine blade individually crafted and balanced to tolerances measured in thousandths of an inch. Then came the Soviet disruption, arriving not as evolution, but revolution, while McDonnell Douglas engineers added another computer system to the Phantom's already complex avionics, while General Electric pursued ever higher compression ratios requiring exotic materials, Soviet designers at OKB 300 asked a fundamentally different question. What if the path to victory lay not through technological superiority, but through operational philosophy? Enter Sergei Konstantinovich Tomansky, a survivor of Stalin's purges who had learned that simplicity meant survival both for machines and their designers. His design bureau operated under constraints Western engineers couldn't imagine. Limited access to high-temperature alloys, manufacturing facilities that ranged from state-of-the-art to barely functional, and maintenance crews often composed of teenage conscripts with three months of technical training. The Western establishment's response bordered on mockery. Aviation Week published articles questioning whether Soviet engines could even achieve their claimed performance figures. British test pilots who had flown captured early MiG-21s reported engines that surged unpredictably, consumed fuel voraciously, and required overhauls at intervals that would ground entire Western air forces. They missed the point entirely. Tomansky wasn't trying to build a better Western engine. He was building something fundamentally different. His team understood a truth that escaped Western designers. In actual combat, an engine that delivers 95% availability with 80% of theoretical performance defeats an engine offering 100% performance but only 60% availability. The mathematics of war are unforgiving. The development path to the R25-300 to reads like a catalog of disasters transformed into lessons. Tomansky's team, including former Gulag prisoners and German engineers captured after the war, had cut their teeth on the R-11 series engines that powered early MiG-21 variants. These power plants earned a fearsome reputation among test pilots. The joke at Zhukovsky Flight Research Institute was that R-11 stood for rarely 11 minutes without problems. Major Georgi Beragovoy, who would later become a cosmonaut, nearly died testing an R-11F-2S-300 variant in 1969. At 45,000 feet over the Kazakh steppe, his engine experienced what engineers euphemistically called catastrophic thermal event. The turbine section essentially melted, sending molten titanium through the aircraft's fuel system. Beregovoy managed to dead stick the burning fighter to a wheels up landing in a wheat field, emerging from the cockpit seconds before the aircraft exploded. The compressor surge problems seemed insurmountable. High-speed cameras revealed the airflow literally reversing direction during certain flight regimes, creating a feedback loop that could destroy the engine in seconds. Western engines solved this with complex variable geometry systems and computer-controlled fuel scheduling. Tomansky's team had neither the technology nor the industrial base for such solutions. The breakthrough emerged from failure itself. 
After the 37th test engine destroyed itself during altitude testing, junior engineer Mikhail Kozlov noticed something peculiar in the wreckage. The compressor blades that survived showed a specific pattern of stress distribution. By deliberately designing blades that would flex predictably under surge conditions, essentially building in controlled failure modes, they could prevent catastrophic disintegration while maintaining most of the engine's performance. This philosophy extended throughout the design. Where Western engineers used exotic single crystal turbine blades, Tumansky specified polycrystalline structures that could be manufactured in any competent foundry. Where American designs required specialized synthetic lubricants, the R25300 ran on oil that could be substituted with diesel fuel in emergencies. But the real innovation lay deeper. Tumansky's team discovered that by accepting a lower overall pressure ratio, 14 to 1 compared to the J79's 17 to 1, they could eliminate entire categories of failure modes. The engine would be thirstier, yes, but it would also be nearly impossible to kill through pilot error or maintenance neglect. Critics within the Soviet military-industrial complex remained skeptical. Marshal Pavel Kutakov famously demanded, why should I accept an engine that drinks fuel like a drunkard? Tumansky's response became legend. Because, comrade Marshal, this drunkard will still be fighting when all the sophisticates have passed out. The pattern interrupt arrived via intelligence reports from Vietnam in 1970. North Vietnamese MiG-21 MFs with R-13300 engines, the R-25300's immediate predecessor, were achieving kill ratios that defied American projections. Despite inferior radar, weapons, and pilot training, they were holding their own against F-4 Phantoms that cost 10 times as much. The secret lay in reliability. MiGs were flying three sorties for every two Phantom missions, simply because they spent less time in maintenance. The breakthrough, engineering revolution. The decision to develop the R25300 specifically for the MiG-21 BIS represented the culmination of hard-learned lessons. The design team, now including young engineers who had never known Stalin's terror, embraced a radical transparency in acknowledging limitations while maximizing strengths. The engine would deliver three things without compromise. Immediate thrust response, cold weather starting reliability, and field maintenance capability using basic tools. The engineering philosophy crystallized around what Tomansky called the three-minute rule. Any critical component should be replaceable by two technicians with standard tools in three minutes or less. This drove design decisions that seemed insane to Western observers. The entire afterburner section could be removed as a single unit. The fuel control system used mechanical linkages instead of hydraulics, accepting reduced precision for absolute reliability. The technological configuration appeared almost primitive on paper. An axial flow turbojet with nine compressor stages, three low pressure, six high pressure, a cannular combustion chamber with 10 flame tubes, and a two-stage turbine. No variable geometry, no sophisticated cooling channels, just brutal efficiency in converting fuel to thrust. But hidden within this simplicity lay sophisticated thinking. The compressor blade angles were optimized for a specific flight envelope, transonic acceleration and supersonic dash, accepting reduced efficiency at other speeds. The combustion chamber design prioritized stable flame holding over emissions or fuel efficiency. Every decision reflected combat experience from Korea, Vietnam, and the Middle East. Prototype testing at Ramenskoye revealed extraordinary results. Test pilot Vladimir Ilyushin reported, engaging afterburner was like being kicked by a giant. The acceleration pinned you to the seat, compressed your chest, made breathing difficult. Below 20,000 feet, nothing could match our acceleration. Not the Phantom, not the Mirage, nothing. The numbers validated the philosophy. The R25300 generated 44.1 kilonewtons of dry thrust and 69.6 kilonewtons in full afterburner from an engine weighing just 1,290 kilograms. The thrust to weight ratio exceeded anything in Western arsenals. More importantly, it could achieve this performance burning standard aviation kerosene operating from unprepared surfaces maintained by conscripts. Here's where deception became strategy. Soviets lied systematically about the R-25300's capabilities, releasing contradictory specifications to confuse Western intelligence. Official publications listed conservative thrust ratings while classified Soviet documents revealed the engine could be emergency rated to 73.5 kilonewtons for brief periods. Export versions were deliberately detuned leading Western analysts to underestimate the domestic variant's performance. This disinformation campaign succeeded so thoroughly that CIA assessments remained wrong about the MIG-21 BIS's acceleration capabilities until after the Cold War ended. The triumph? Changing the game. Combat reality. 
The R25300 powered MiG-21 Biz entered service with Frontal Aviation in 1972, immediately transforming Soviet tactical doctrine. Its performance envelope rewrote engagement parameters. The engine could power a zoom climb to 59,000 feet, entering the realm where the sky turns purple and the curvature of Earth becomes visible. From sea level, it could reach 36,000 feet in 2.5 minutes, faster than most surface-to-air missiles of the era. During the 1973 Yom Kippur War, Syrian MiG-21 Biz fighters demonstrated the engine's combat utility. Captain Ahmad Wafi, engaging Israeli F-4E Phantoms over the Golan Heights, later described the experience. The Israeli pilot tried to escape in a climb. I followed him vertical, expecting my engine to quit as older MiGs would. Instead, the R-25-300 kept pulling, kept accelerating. At 45,000 feet, his Phantom stalled. Mine didn't. Indian Air Force Wing Commander Sunith Francis, who flew R-25-300 equipped MiGs during the 1971 Indo-Pakistani War, noted a crucial advantage. We could start our engines in minus 40 degree conditions in Ladakh, fly a combat mission, land on a highway to refuel from trucks, and launch again. All while Pakistani F-104s remained grounded with frozen hydraulics. The acceleration statistics told only part of the story. In the transonic regime, Mach 0.9 to 1.1, where most aerial engagements occurred, the R-25-300's response was essentially instantaneous. Pilots described the throttle as connected directly to their spine, thrust arriving without lag or hesitation. Operational mastery. The sound signature became psychological warfare. The R-25-300's distinctive howl, a combination of compressor whine and combustion roar, announced its presence from miles away. Egyptian pilots called it the Devil's Whistle. Israeli pilots reported that the sound alone would trigger adrenaline responses, knowing that Merge was seconds away. Ground crews developed an almost mystical relationship with the engine. Soviet Crew Chief Sergeant Dmitry Volkov recalled, you could diagnose problems by sound alone. A slight whistle meant FOD in the third stage compressor. A rumble indicated bearing wear. The engine talked to you if you knew how to listen. The maintenance reality contradicted every Western assumption. While an F-4 Phantom required an average of 30 maintenance hours per flight hour, the MiG-21 BIS with R-25-300 needed just 12. The entire hot section inspection could be performed through borescope ports in 30 minutes. Engine changes, catastrophic events for Western Air Forces, became routine procedures accomplished in under two hours. The engine transformed Third World Air Forces overnight. Nations that couldn't maintain sophisticated Western fighters suddenly possessed genuine supersonic capability. Egyptian MiG-21 BIS squadrons achieved 85% availability rates, higher than Israeli F-4 units despite vast differences in technical resources. The Expansion – Worldwide Phenomenon Warsaw Pact adoption followed predictable patterns, but the Third World embrace revealed the engine's true genius. India modified the R-25-300 with local components, creating the Kimki Modi variant that burned lower-grade fuel. Egypt experimented with water injection for increased thrust. Cuba developed field modification kits allowing engines to operate on Soviet diesel fuel during the Angola intervention. The technical transfer was remarkable, like teaching calculus through demonstration rather than theory. North Korean technicians, working without manuals, successfully overhauled R-25-300S using techniques learned by observation. Vietnamese mechanics developed improvised test stands from captured American equipment, achieving results that matched Soviet factory specifications. African operators discovered unexpected advantages. The R-25-300's tolerance for foreign object damage, engineered for Russian dirt strips, proved invaluable on runways contaminated with sand, volcanic ash, or battle debris. During the Ogaden War, Ethiopian MiG-21 BIS fighters operated from airstrips that would have destroyed Western engines within hours. In Finland, a NATO-aligned nation operating Soviet equipment, engineers conducted detailed comparisons with Western engines. Their classified report, leaked after the Cold War, concluded that while less efficient and shorter-lived, the R-25-300 offered superior combat availability and lower life cycle costs when maintenance infrastructure was considered. The Decline – Changing Times The 1980s brought challenges the R-25-300 couldn't overcome through simplicity alone. Fourth-generation fighters introduced beyond-visual-range engagement as standard doctrine. The MiG-21 BIS's radar couldn't guide modern missiles effectively, making the r 25300 spectacular acceleration increasingly irrelevant. Fuel efficiency emerged as strategically critical. Modern conflicts required sustained air patrols, not brief interceptions. The R-25300's prodigious thirst, 
consuming 2.5 kilograms of fuel per second at full afterburner, limited mission flexibility. NATO's introduction of aerial refueling as standard practice meant Western fighters could maintain station indefinitely while MiG-21 BIS squadrons rotated constantly. Environmental considerations, even in military aviation, couldn't be ignored. The R-25-300's visible exhaust trail, a mixture of unburned fuel and combustion products, made visual tracking easy. Infrared missiles locked onto its heat signature from ranges that negated the MiG-21's agility advantages. The shift toward multi-role capabilities rendered specialized interceptors obsolete. Modern fighters needed to switch from air-to-air -to, -air to ground attack mid-mission. The R-25-300, optimized for high-altitude acceleration, proved poorly suited for low-level operations where fuel consumption became prohibitive. Production ceased in 1985 without fanfare. The final R-25-300 rolled off the assembly line at the Chernyshev machine building plant as workers prepared tooling for the next generation. No ceremony marked the end of an era that had seen over 11,000 engines produced. Legacy and resurrection. Contemporary aviation recognizes the R-25-300's influence in unexpected places. Modern Russian engines like the Saturn AL-31F incorporate maintenance philosophy directly descended from Tomansky's vision. Chinese engineers studying captured R-25-300S developed the WS-13 engine, explicitly copying the modular maintenance approach. Private collectors now treasure surviving examples. By 2010, operational MiG-21 BIS fighters commanded premium prices specifically for the R-25-300 experience. American collector Don Curlin, who owns two examples, describes flying them. It's raw, visceral, immediate. Modern fighters feel like computers. The R-25-300 feels alive, dangerous, barely controlled. The engineering principles resurface in contemporary designs. SpaceX's Merlin rocket engine follows similar philosophy, accepting lower specific impulse for manufacturability and reliability. The emphasis on operational simplicity over theoretical optimization traces directly to lessons learned from engines like the R-25-300. Modern military thinkers study the R-25-300 as a case study in asymmetric capability development. When resources are limited, the engine demonstrates optimizing for specific advantages rather than general capability can yield superior combat effectiveness. Recent developments in expendable drone engines explicitly reference R-25-300 design principles. The Turkish Bayraktar TB-2's engine, while much smaller, follows identical philosophy, simplicity, reliability, and acceptance of limitations to achieve specific objectives. Human aviation history oscillates between complexity and simplicity, between pursuing perfection and accepting reality. The R-25-300 stands as testament that engineering excellence doesn't always mean sophisticated solutions. Sometimes the most elegant answer is the simplest one that actually works. Consider modern parallels. Silicon Valley's move fast and break things. Philosophy echoes Tomansky's approach. Tesla's gigafactories prioritize manufacturing simplicity over theoretical efficiency. The R-25-300 pioneered these concepts in jet propulsion proving that operational philosophy matters more than technical specifications. Would you trust your life to an engine designed around what couldn't go wrong rather than what could go right? Would you choose proven reliability over promised capability? Would you accept that sometimes the crude solution that works beats the elegant solution that doesn't? What if modern aviation embraced radical simplicity again? What if we stopped pursuing marginal efficiency improvements and focused on revolutionary changes in operational philosophy? The R-25-300's legacy suggests that the next breakthrough might come not from adding capability, but from strategically removing it. The Tomansky R-25-300 remains more than historical curiosity. It's a reminder that in engineering, as in combat, victory belongs not to the perfect, but to the present. Not to the sophisticated, but to the sustainable. Not to those who never fail, but to those who fail fast, learn faster, and keep flying when others remain grounded. Every time a modern fighter launches from an austere base, every time maintenance crews perform miracles with limited resources, every time simplicity triumphs over complexity, the ghost of the R-25-300 to roars approval, that distinctive banshee wail echoing across time, reminding us that sometimes the old ways of thinking about problems remain the best ways of solving them.